Okay. Um, Belinda teaches accounting at the postgraduate level. Uh, her research relates to accountability and entrepreneurship in public sector and third sector organisations. And prior to joining ac academia, she worked for a big four accounting firm across Australia, the Ukraine, Papua New Guinea and China. So some great experience to bring to our session today. Please join me in welcoming Belinda. Thanks, Kristen. Um, as Kristen said, yes, I'm based in an accounting school, but my research is in entrepreneurship and more recently in third sector organisations. So uh, organisations like social enterprise, which for some would uh, initially as a concept is thought of as quite entrepreneurial because it's changing a traditional not-for-profit and it blends the social and commercial objectives into one organisation itself. Um, but the question then becomes, well, is every social enterprise entrepreneurial? And my view would be not necessarily, but I think that nicely leads into our discussion today. So the question I'll start off with is, what is entrepreneurship? And for a lot of people, when we look in the literature, it's frame breaking, it's innovation, it's radical change, and it's risk. And so if I said, is that essentially what entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship is about? Uh, well, yes and no. It can be about those things, but it doesn't necessarily have to be each of those. And while some people are really comfortable with those ideas, not necessarily everybody is. So I think it's important to look more in detail about, well, what has happened within entrepreneurship literature? So initially, and this was back from the early 1800s, is entrepreneurship was all about um, individuals. They were bold, risk-taking. It was all about a profit objective. And so we were looking at the entrepreneurial traits of the individual. That was very much the focus of the research. But as we moved on, and particularly into the 1960s, it was about new and small businesses. And so there was an idea at one stage that, well, new and small business is entrepreneurship. But it was later viewed that probably that's better considered an association rather than an explanation, in that entrepreneurship can happen in new and small businesses, but it doesn't mean that every new or small business is necessarily entrepreneurial. So as research moved on, they started to look at large organisations. So this was corporate entrepreneurship, firm level entrepreneurship, and looking at the entrepreneurial processes. And importantly, what they also started to talk about then was intrapreneurship. So intrapreneurship came out as a distinct theme in that it was entrepreneurship within, for example, a division, a department, or a single business unit. So it wasn't necessarily reflective of the whole firm, but it was distinct in one particular area. And there are pros and cons for that, because while one area might be considered innovative, they might also be the ones who are the risk takers. It wasn't necessarily reflective of the culture as a whole. Um, and we'll come back to some of those issues in a moment. But it wasn't where research stopped, thank goodness, because what they decided then as they reflected further, particularly into early 2000s, is that entrepreneurship is businesses of all forms and sizes. So it's not unique to any division or individual to new or small businesses. Much better it can be understood as a concept. So if you put all of those ideas together, it basically looks like this, or in a slightly different way, but the same thing is much like this. It's processes when individuals have to be behind those processes. Done well, it's strategic. It's part of a strategy or a plan. It happens quite often within businesses and it's about exploiting opportunity through innovation. So it's all of those ideas that come together that we recognise as entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship if it's happening within an organisation, just within one part of an organisation. So we see entrepreneurship happens in diverse contexts. So private sector, we typically associated individuals, organisations, so the corporate entrepreneurship, and the entrepreneurship or the single business unit. Public sector was then considered slightly distinct in terms of how they viewed entrepreneurship. And third sector was typically associated with what we call social entrepreneurship. In that they, so that's your not-for-profits, your social enterprises. They were undertaking entrepreneurial activity, but really with a social objective behind that rather than a profit objective, which we typically associate with the private sector. But as we started to look more at this, we saw, well, individuals and businesses isn't specific to the private sector. It can happen in both the public and the third sector. Similarly, social entrepreneurship, that's not unique to the third sector. There is lots of private sector and public sector organisations who undertake entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial activity with a social objective. And if we go one step further, we see that actually there's collaboration across the sectors. And it's when we do see that collaboration that sometimes it's the most effective. So while we have quite a few different perspectives, essentially entrepreneurship as a concept is the same in those diverse contexts. 
Drucker, famous um, management uh, scholar, said, in every case there is a discipline we might call entrepreneurial management. And really that's the key that's come out of here. So if I go back to the question then of well, what is entrepreneurship, at the heart of this is opportunity identification and innovation. And we still then talk about things like frame breaking innovation and creative destruction. Okay, why fit in when you could, could stand out? But again, not everybody's necessarily comfortable with those concepts. Sometimes they seem a bit radical or extreme and not everyone necessarily wants to stand out as the risk taker. But actually, if we go back and just have a look at the key themes that come out of the literature across the years, we see it's opportunity identification, innovation and risk that are central to entrepreneurship. But I think what's important and sometimes what's underplayed is that that's often balanced with vision, flexibility and growth. Okay, so we'll just have a look at each of those concepts in a little bit more detail. Okay, opportunity often comes often comes in different forms and so obviously it can be within the business but it doesn't have to be that way and quite often when I go and talk to organisations they find that opportunities come from talking with others in networks, with customers, with suppliers because it's identifying a need and it's often though people outside the organisations who, who know what their need is, they just haven't had that need addressed or satisfied. An example of this in the public sector is I spent quite a bit of time working or researching New Zealand state-owned enterprises, so public sector organisations with a commercial objective. And they, one in particular, MetService, which is the national weather forecaster, quite well known for very reliable forecasting in perhaps a nation with weather that isn't so easy to forecast, um, and also a skill just in basic weather graphics back 10, 15 years ago, just basic images in newspapers. But what they found is that they were approached by a television, uh, television station who wanted to have 3D graphic software based on the weather forecasting and actually it's what probably most of us just see on the news each night and take for granted. But 10, 15 years ago this was really quite innovative. So MetService was approached by a customer and they worked together on a joint project and the TV station got it to a point that they were happy. So they, wanted the pro they were happy for the project to end. Whereas MetService th felt there was more innovation to do, more development that would mean more commercial opportunities. And so that's exactly what they did by themselves and it's now the um, software that's sold to TV stations around the world and not only to television stations, to other um, industries as well. So it's sometimes a case that opportunity knocks, but most importantly it knocks because people know what your core strengths are. And I think we heard that a moment ago, knowing yourself. Okay, innovation. So definitely innovation is important and it's not enough to have an idea, it's obviously that you need to act on that idea. Okay, innovation is change that unlocks new value and we often think of that as economic value but it doesn't have to be because we're not just operating in economic markets, obviously we're operating in social markets as well. So there's different types of value that can be unlocked. When we talk about innovation, it's, we often say it's thinking outside the box, but I think an important question to ask is, well, how far outside the box? Because if we think about those extreme radical ideas that nobody else had possibly thought of, then innovation seems a little bit elusive or selective. But actually, when we look at the theory on innovation, they break it down into deliberate versus emergent. So sometimes we discover things that we hadn't necessarily intended. Sorry, I'll just go back. And we also talk about incremental versus radical. So obviously the mobile phone market radically changed the way we operated or the mobile phone industry. But there's been a lot of incremental innovations that have made really substantial and valuable changes, but they haven't been completely left field. And so it's important to know where you could fit on that spectrum. It doesn't have to be all about deliberate and it doesn't have to be all about radical. Okay, most importantly, innovation doesn't have to be about profits. So it can be, but it's not solely profits. It's about the environment as well as people, and it's bringing something new to the market. And I think that's really important. So it's something that's being introduced to the market that's making a difference. Importantly, in innovation needs to be differentiated from imitation, okay? And that doesn't mean that imitation's bad. I often go and talk to companies and they say, we saw someone in the US doing it, we thought it was a really good model, it seemed to be getting great outcomes, so we've replicated it back here. There's not a problem with replication at all, but it is distinct from innovation. But the other thing, and we heard this before, is that not all ideas are good ones, okay? And it's important to realise once you have an idea that you've 
think isn't going to be commercial or doesn't have potential, that you need to be able to walk away from that. Okay, in terms of risk, we will often hear this idea of risk, but I think what is more appropriate is an acceptance of risk. Because risk is often there, but it's a matter of identifying that risk. And we talk about companies with a different appetite for risk or a different tolerance for risk. And really, as long as you feel that you can identify the risk, then you can also manage it and try and mitigate that risk. So it comes to then being a very deliberate choice rather than a random variable that, yeah, we're risk takers. We just threw ourselves in at the deep end. And I think that's a very different um, philosophy or very different ideas. But it also comes back to a point that we've talked about earlier this morning, which is about knowing yourself, okay? Knowing your strengths and weaknesses, because if you are aware of what you're good at and things you aren't so good at, you'll then be able to choose your risks appropriately and manage those risks. So again, another state owned enterprise I looked at, they were actually in the agricultural industry, but they found that their business management processes needed a lot of work. So they actually introduced or developed some business management software, which was great for the organisation internally. And then they found that it probably had commercial potential outside the organisation. So great, a new revenue stream, a new project. In fact, it won an entrepreneurial award, so it was, it was externally validated that this is an innovative thing to do. But what they found is that when they went to market it, very few people wanted the off-the-shelf version. Everyone wanted it customised, adapted, it was more time, more cost, and and actually it was going down a path that there wasn't necessarily their core skill set. So it almost became a little bit of a risk for them. Do they invest another $1 million in this software, which isn't their core business, or do they take that same $1 million and invest it in their core business, which they know they're good at and they know the returns, the more reliable returns potentially from there. So I think knowing the risks is definitely very important and matching those risks to your strengths and capabilities. Okay, vision again, I think is, is something that probably isn't talked about enough, but I often show the slide on the left and someone will say, oh yes, I see we've got an opportunity to plant one more tree. Okay, so people see things differently. But I think, you know, what some people see as an opportunity, others do see as a risk. I don't see myself as entrepreneurial at all, and I don't necessarily see myself as a risk taker, but looking back and the countries that I've loved working in, so in emerging markets such as Ukraine in the mid-90s, Papua New Guinea, China, I guess there's a bunch of people who couldn't think of anything worse. Okay? I love chaos because you can only ever make it better. I love working with the local staff and building up a business. Okay, it's a lot of fun and very rewarding, but not everybody feels that way. So if people are asking me politely, they'll say, so you chose to go there, just to check I wasn't sent. Most people just come out and say, oh my God, were you sent there? No, I love those kind of environments. But again, it's playing to your strengths or knowing what you're walking into. So I think it's being able to see in, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, but also being able to see out. So knowing the opportunities and the threats for any environment that you're walking into. Okay, flexibility and growth, these seem like, I guess, again, a little bit underplayed, but I do think they're quite important. Flexibility is important in any business. You've got to have options. You've got to be able to see those options. Um, and in terms of entrepreneurship, I think that's really important, or entrepreneurship, because it can often mean experimenting or playing with ideas without having to make it a long-term commitment, or without having to have a high-cost investment. And the companies that we see do that well often do just what they call build in slack. They just provide a little bit of extra funds, they provide a little bit of extra time, but they want, they encourage people to experiment. So having flexibility in routines is really important. I think it's also important for the external environment so that something one change outside doesn't completely change your plans or leave you with no opportunities going forward. So another example of a state-owned enterprise, and I walked into about 12 of them in New Zealand, and at the time there was approximately 16. I asked them what they thought they might have done recently that was entrepreneurial, and there was a whole bunch of different interpretations, but one company which is in electricity generation said that they'd recently put a um, electricity generation plant in a greenfield site. So they thought that was quite novel and interesting. Novel, yes, innovative, I'm not sure. Um, but 
And what happened is while they were quite happy that this was going to address what was a really big energy crisis in New Zealand with unreliable power supply, power cuts, and partic particularly people in the north of Auckland being at particular risk, um, one year later it was an election year and the government had gone green, they didn't want to know anything about this power station, it was an absolute liability. Okay, with all their time and commitment that they'd put in, there was very few options for them other than just going forward. So for them what that meant at the time was just budgeting extra legal fees because they knew they were going to be taken through a series of court cases to try and stop this project going ahead. So if you can have flexibility in your plans, definitely that's important. And going back to that earlier example of the business management software in the agricultural company, they realised that really spending ongoing and unknown funds on business software, which wasn't their core business, was really too much of a risk. And in the end, they decided to sell it. So they had that flexibility. They had another option. They still received a financial return on it, but they also then limited their risks. So I think both of those are definitely important things to acknowledge. Importantly, entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship literature comes from strategy. And so there's just a few key um, terms that come up in the literature. But I think that's really important because when we think of entrepreneurship or innovative ideas as something that are maybe remote, select, hard to access, I think when we leads into this idea of strategic entrepreneurship, which for me seems far more accessible for any particular organisation. Because strategic entrepreneurship is about doing entrepreneurial activity, so it's still the opportunity identification, the innovation and the acceptance of risk, but doing it from the foundation of what you're good at. Okay, what are your core strengths as a business? What are your core skills and resources? Because if you're leveraging from those core skills and resources, it's gonna mean you're far more confident in the projects you're taking on, and it's gonna mean you're far more familiar with the skills required, which is that example of Met Service when they were doing the weather forecasting but moving into graphics software. So in a two by two matrix, okay, academics love these. So top left, we've got strategic entrepreneurship. Right is the strategic activity. Left, bottom left, my entrepreneurial activity and bottom right, neither entrepreneurial nor strategic activity. Okay, so I go into these state-owned enterprises and I ask about, well, can you tell me something that's entrepreneurial? I'm really assessing whether I think it's entrepreneurial and more importantly, whether I think it's strategic and entrepreneurial. Um, and so the entrepreneurial activity example would be that business management software. It was entrepreneurial, but it had a very limited um, life for that particular organisation. Strategic is that energy generation plant. It was something that the industry needed, that the country needed. Um, was it politically strategic? I guess that's a slightly different issue. Uh, neither entrepreneurial nor strategic. There was one example of this, and my background is in tax law and working for the accounting firm, and they basically told me that they had done tax evasion. So my the politest way I could say that was tax effective financing, but I was quite surprised that anyone wanted to sell that as their entrepreneurial idea. And yet I could understand where they were coming from in a way. Number one, it was endorsed by the government. Number two, they weren't the only SOE who had done this. It just hadn't been widely publicised. Uh, and number three, they were under huge cost constraints. They were under a number of regulators who wouldn't allow them to increase their fees. And yet they're expected to do another uh, $40 million investment over a series of years. So they had huge financial problems and they needed to address that somewhere, somehow. So when they were invited into a transaction, which was really no substance to it other than going through the Cayman Islands and saving someone a lot of tax, and they received a $36 million payment out of it. I'm not sure it was entrepreneurial or strategic, but for them at the time, they thought it was a worthwhile transaction. But I think the ones that are more important to look at are those ones in the top left. So we talked about the innovative 3D weather graphics software because it was leveraging from the company's core skills and resources, but it was taking them just into a slightly different market. But they never particularly felt out of their depth. They always had confidence in what they were doing. Two other examples, a training simulator for air traffic controllers. So one of the state-owned enterprises is in charge of air traffic control. and 
despite New Zealand being a small country, this particular organisation is very well recognised as a leader in the industry. It's on a number of um, different international organisations. And they found that they had spent a little bit of time um, establishing a simulator for their own in-house training, but they'd done such a good job of it that actually they had people from all around the world wanting to send their staff down and be trained by that state-owned enterprise. Again, it wasn't an intentional thing, it wasn't a strategy they started out at the beginning, but it emerged as a very steady, stable and growing revenue stream and it was entrepreneurial. It was a side business which then required more resources in terms of staff and time, but certainly it was paying dividends for them. Other ones similarly was a state-owned enterprise that's in the business of farming and they got to a point where they simply didn't have any more cash to invest to purchase farms but what they noticed is there was quite a few overseas farmland owners or even hobby farmers but on a very large scale who weren't making the most of their land. So because they were, their core skill was developing land and then farming it, they then approached those different people, went into negotiations to say, can we develop it for you and then can we lease it back and farm land, farm on that land, and again, a very strong revenue stream, but something related to their core business, so they never felt out of their depth. I think the important thing, and I also think this is underplayed a little bit, is that when we looked at strategic entrepreneurship and found, well, what were companies, do, what was the commonalities among those companies, there was three things that we noticed. Number one was organisational excellence. They have very strong skills in their core business operations. Number two was culture, and so it was encouraged. There was a culture, and it wasn't necessarily a formal manner of here's your R&D budget. It wasn't considered high cost, but it was always allowing time and a little bit of money for playing, experimenting, tinkering around the edges. So the language in those organisations was very informal, but the innovations were very much tangible, being crystallised. And the other thing was cost minimisation. So while they were doing, while they were experimenting and playing with new ideas, there was never necessarily a lot of money involved. And they said, by the time we are spending a lot of money, we're pretty sure this idea is going to go into a product or service that has strong commercial potential. So I think that's really important, three things to take away in terms of playing to your strengths, having a culture which encourages and accepts that and realising then that perhaps it isn't necessarily a high cost venture to be able to do this if it's part of the culture of the organisation, which also then helps manage the risk because the financial risk becomes so much less. We said that entrepreneurship is pretty much the same across different contexts and while that's true, I think there's also quite distinct differences in the implications depending on if you're one person, if you're a large organisation or if you're in the public sector. So some of the themes that came out was, look, you know, we're just doing commercial activity like anyone else would. If it wasn't for us doing this project, I think someone else would have done it. We just happened to be an SOE. So being public sector was not considered a bar barrier at all. But there was an also an acknowledgement of we play to our strengths. So I think if we went and started to grow tom tomatoes, the minister would be a little bit interested. But I think we're rooted in a, dom um, in a domain expertise. We self-limit more than by edict. So m being within your core skills and resources. But definitely you can't ignore the, the implications of public sector. So if something's a success, people are queuing up to say how well you've done. If it's a failure, you get kicked. Which leads into that public identity and profile, I think. Because we're a state-owned enterprise, people believe rightly or wrongly that they should have ability to influence our policies and business, from the NGOs to the Greenpeaces to the Minister of Finance. And I think that's inevitable in really in what we see. So what I would say is I, I do, I'm a strong believer in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. I think start with the strategy, so play to your core strengths. It's about ideas and that must come from people. And while there's been a discussion about rowing versus steering I definitely, and subsequent discussions, I definitely think that there is an acknowledgement that innovation can happen anywhere and entrepreneurship can happen anywhere and that if you're not getting results from what you've done previously, then you need to do things slightly differently and see the change that's coming from that. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, I think we're having questions after the next two presenters, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, Belinda. Um, I was going to try and summarise, but you've just done 
almost what I had written down in your last slide, so it seems a bit redundant. Or they did want to pick up on the fact that for a couple of things that we've echoed that, that knowing yourself and knowing your strengths, and I really liked that think outside the box, but how far outside the box. And I hadn't, um, I'm not familiar with the, with the term strategic entrepreneurship and thinking about how you build on your strengths to do something innovative and new. So that's been tremendously useful. And I really liked how you took us back through some of the literature as the, as the basis. I think often we come to these discussions, you know, knowing the word. I, I was in a uh, workshop uh, last week, which was all about storytelling. You know, we all think we know what storytelling means, but unless we actually break it down, we end up having conversations that are not terribly useful and that are not um, really getting beyond, you know, the very shallow level of what we're discussing. And I think you've enabled us to take a much deeper level of the discussion, so much appreciated. Uh, our next presenter is Carmel Williams. Um, Carmel is the manager of strategic partnerships unit, um, previously called the health and all policies unit. And both Carmel and our next speaker, Tony Delaney, will be, will be speaking a little bit around the health and all policies um, I guess projects, initiatives, and looking at how they how they link. Um, so Carmel's led the development of this since 2007, which includes South Australia's focus on co-benefits, delivering public policy and health outcomes. And lately, her work has been towards directing and ad towards adapting and translating um, this approach. Uh, importantly, Carmel's been the lead project lead for the Working Together for Joined Up Project Delivery 90 Day Project, and that's what she's going to talk to us about today. So please join me in welcoming Carmel. Good morning everyone, it's lovely to be here today. Um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the work that we did with the 90 Day Project, which was looking at working together, how we might go about trying to increase collaboration um, across the public sector so that we are able to be more innovative, so that we are able to be more entrepreneurial. Um, and um, so really I'm going to sort of start to talk about this a bit and then Tony's going to follow me and talk more specifically about some of the research we've done uh, that she's led um, at, from Flinders University around what sort of entrepreneurial uh, innovation strategies in, through the health and our policies approach have actually proved to be effective and where we need to continue to work and grow. So first of all, maybe I could start with why is the health department or the health system care about collaboration and policy across government. One of the drivers for us is that actually the health department's really good at fixing people when they're sick. So we've got a, um, a hospital not too far away now that spe spent a lot of money on trying to organise and be more efficient in helping people when they're ill. The health department is not good at creating the conditions and the environment which enable people to be well. But um, I work in an area which is the health promotion prevention area and that's our role, is around how to help people be well and prevent us all from going to the new RA so we can help and reduce the ever-growing hospital um, budget. So you can see here from this slide that actually the conditions that create health and wellbeing are, um, often lie outside the direct control of the health sector. So the things that make us healthy is not going to a doctor. The things that make us healthy is housing, is access to adequate food, it's being part of a lovely social community, it's about having a meaningful job, it's about you know living in a culture that's um, inclusive and tolerant. And the health department doesn't have control of these things. And so we need to work with others to be able to improve health and wellbeing. Another example is you probably all are well aware of the obesity epidemic that's actually plaguing um, actually the whole globe, not just, uh, not just um, high income countries but also low and middle income countries. Um, and obesity is caused by a, a diverse set of factors and this slide from the Foresight group, Foresight group from the UK maps out the different players and impacts on why it is difficult for people as individuals and populations to, co to control their weight. You can see that it's got education dimensions, it's got market force dimensions, it's got um, agricultural dimensions, it's got trade dimensions. So if we really want to address the challenges of the obesogenic environment, the health department needs to work with the agricultural sector, we need to work with the food industry, we need to work with the education sector. So it re we really need to work together. Um, and so if we want to address obesity, which is really considered to be a wicked policy problem, one of those really complex issues, we need to strengthen our ability to collaborate. But luckily, 
or, un or uh, unfortunately, it's not just health department that has complex, wicked policy problems. Many of you from other parts of government uh, would be also facing complex, wicked problems. So currently, South Australia is going through an economic transition. This would be considered to be a, a, a significant policy problem. And that would require collaboration from multiple other agencies, not just the Department of State Development, not just the Department of Treasury and Finance. This requires us to work collaboratively across government. It requires us to be innovative. It requires us to be able to um, look for opportunities and seek opportunities and work collaboratively together. And I think if I reflect on what Belinda was saying, it really requires the public sector to stop being so risk averse. Um, but it's not. One of the problems with the public sector is that actually um, government agencies are risk averse and they don't like working together. We often operate in um, silos or in structures. Um, the way governments establish is that we sit, we establish around portfolio boundaries of issues. So we, an economic issue or an education issue or an agricultural issue and that technical expertise or the skill and expertise within the organisation relates to the um, um, agricultural perspective. We don't necessarily, we're not structured so that we're able to work and collaborate and share uh, across those boundaries. Actually, our governments look a bit like, our government departments look a bit like this. I mean, we operate in silos. It, we, the, we're structured, our risk averse, um, the way we protect ourselves from risk, the way the government protects itself from risk, is ministers have complete control at the top of the silo. And then under that you have chief executives and all of the leadership contains itself within those boundaries. And my director, Kevin Bucket, often considers and talks about um, government departments really being more like castles and keeps, that actually their boundaries are actively defended and that people are, uh, you know, th that it's very difficult to get people to, in competing castles and keeps, to collaborate. We're actually competitors. The way it's structured that government departments are, operate a bit like we're competing with each other for our budgets and for, for our policy controls. And what we're needing to do is to, um, really, we are needing to, to change the way we operate. So the 90-day project that I worked with, with um, project sponsors from across government, really was looking at how we can overcome and break these, si these silos, how we can break through these castles and keeps. So it's not just the structures that are also a problem, because I'm talking about policy, not programs and services, not business enterprises, but policy environment that sets the scene for the um, services. And the policy cycle itself is also complicated and complex. And actually, um, to be able to work collaboratively across government, it really means that policy makers from one agency needs to be prepared to lose control of their, of their area. Some of you might well have been in, um, done cabinet submissions where you've done a lot of work and you've actually pulled together a lot of uh, pieces of work and spent a lot of time gathering the research, got your political uh, uh, authorising environment right, and then to collaborate with someone down the track would mean that actually all of that work you've done might be undermined or have to be redone because they've come up with a problem or a challenge or, you know, cabinet comments might, you know, set you back months and, and weeks. So. The policy cycle itself actually really requires us to start at the beginning, to collaborate at the very beginning of the idea before we're too far down the track. So, if, so that we can, in losing control and in sharing power, that actually the, um, that, that the investment, that, that the cost isn't too high. So what did we do in our 90 day project? We had a, a governance structure established um, where we had four chief executives and uh, senior executives from across government working with us. So it wasn't just the health department, although we are very interested in this space. Um, it was also uh, Irma from the Office of Public Sector Reform, because this was about changing and reforming the public sector. How can we strengthen collaboration across the public sector? We had Sandy Pitcher from uh, the Chief Executive of Environment, Water and Natural Resources, because the environment sector is also interested in, in strengthening collaboration and enhancing collaboration. And uh, our director from within health, uh, Dr Kevin Bucket. And we also had Ruth Ambler the, from Cabinet Office. Cabinet Office obviously has a critical role to play in how it collaborates and sees and supports collaboration. 
we actually went through a, quite a rigorous process. We looked at the literature on what are the barriers and enablers of collaboration across government. We surveyed a number of, um, of public services. We wanted to hear from your voice. We wanted to hear your lived experience around what the opportunities of working together are, or what the barriers are. And um, we then uh, contextualise that to South Australia by actually working with case examples around what's worked well and what hasn't. What was really interesting was that we found, regardless of whether we went to the literature, national literature, whether we looked at case studies, whether we looked at what was happening with the 90 day change projects, whether we spoke to you through the survey, the, the, the findings were consistent. That actually, to be able to collaborate effectively and to work together in a way that produces positive results, we need shared vision. And that needs to be vision from the top right through to um, lower levels of our leadership. We need uh, resourcing and budgets that enable people to work together. Um, many of you, you know, our budgets, the ability to actually have a multilateral budget bid get up is very limited. I think there's only been one or two that have been. Um, so our whole bilateral process of negotiating funding and budgets within departments really prevents and makes it almost impossible for us to work collaboratively and to put ideas forward jointly. It's also the way our government structured the idea about who's responsibility, who gets the rewards and who gets the, who's accountable if things go wrong. So how we set up accountability and responsibility. It's about trust and respect. Many government agencies have a completely different culture. Um, one of the things that we've done when we've worked with health and policies in collaborating across other government departments is it's very clear that different government agencies operate under different cultures. The health department, for example, is very driven by evidence and it's also very hierarchical. It's very top down. So there's a decision made at the top uh, and, it, and it flows down through the system. When working with the education department, the education department seems much more um, bottom up. Schools and principals have a lot more control and actually work up through the system. So culture is important. Uh, and flexible mechanisms, I think also picking up on some of what Belinda was saying. So the recommendations of the 90 Day Project came up with um, three broad areas that we need to be, the government needs to pursue and the public sector needs to pursue if we're going to strengthen our collaboration and we're going to be able to address some of the complex policy issues that we require and we're going to strengthen the opportunities for people to be innovative. So, um, so governance and accountability. So SMC have signed off on these recommendations and they've accepted, the Senior Management Council, that they have responsibility to support collaboration and to encourage us to work together. Processes and tools, people need to know how to go about collaboration. There was a strong sense from the survey that people do want to collaborate across the public sector. You all told us that that's something that you would like to do more of. Some of you were able to do it, others aren't. But people struggled to work out how to do it and when to do it. Not every policy issue requires us to collab requires collaboration. But the ones that do, those wicked complex ones, actually people need to know what are they? When, are, when is it an issue we need to be asking themselves, is this a wicked complex problem? Should I be collaborating with others? And then to go about how to do it. So one of the things that we'll be doing um, through Cabinet Office is developing a tool and guide and SMC will launch this. But probably most importantly are the people. And this is where I think the work that we've done really intersects nicely with the entrepreneurship work and, and the entrepreneurship group because people are critical to actually enable working together in collaboration. Most of us probably come within our departments and get appointed to our roles with technical expertise that's specific to our department's portfolio area of responsibility. So we'll be an economist, or we'll be a teacher, or we'll be a, a health practitioner. The skills that are required to collaborate and, and to be innovative and to, to be an entrepreneur are the skills that are less are less technical and they're more tactical. So the skills that enable you to navigate and boundary ride, the skills that enable you to identify when you need to link with people, the skills that, are, that enable you to, um, to develop strong trusting relationships with people outside of your organisation. They're the skills that are required. And the recommendations are that we need to identify these people within the public sector, what we've called change agents. Um, and that uh, they need to be able to set up a bit of a community of practice and then through that we we'll, can, can continue to grow the opportunities for collaboration. 
So this is what the model looks like in practice, um, and this is the, all of these pieces are coming together. It sits on the culture and ethos of the public sector, which Irma talked to about earlier, about our need for us to, um, uh, to renew that. It's based on our public sector values, and it's really helping us deliver. So in working together to improve joined up policy delivery, we're actually also trying to support the better together principles by working together successfully across government and then government being able to work effectively and intersect with um, community around what it is their need, then ultimately we should be able to deliver better public value. We should be delivering public value for the citizens of South Australia. And my last slide is that what we're really wanting to do is to move the public sector across this continuum. Many of us operate in the coexistence or communication ends of this, of this continuum. What we're really wanting to get to is the collaboration end, where there's shared responsibility, shared accountability, shared recognition, and that we, that we have then shared outcomes. So that's it, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Carmel. I was, um just trying to pick up a couple of things in what I'm what I'm tweeting out, and again we come back to the know yourself um, bit. But I, I, what um, what your presentation's done for me is start to also make the the formal renewal of the structure quite explicit, and I think that's really interesting. Often um, the idea of entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship is seen as this: um, you're, you're not playing within the rules. You're trying to test the system. You're trying to do it differently. And I think what we're sort of saying in here is actually to do you know, complex policy making work and to do that differently, then actually formalising a structure can, can help. Um, and I, I think that tension of um, creativity versus um, control is, is a really interesting one that might be worth, uh, worth exploring. Um, how do we move to a new system where uh, the mode of entrepreneurship and innovation is the way that we work, rather than having to always play with the system? Um, I'd now like to introduce our final speaker before we go to the panel, um, Tony Delaney. Dr Delaney is a research fellow at the Southgate Institute for Health, Society and Equity at Flinders University. Uh, her research focuses on understanding the factors that support intersectorial collaborations to address the social determinants of health, well-being and equity. Um, and as I said, she has um, connections um, with her research which has been supporting um, work under the Health and All Policies Initiative in South Australia. Um, and health is such a, a great example to be working working through um, these ideas of theory and, and practice. So please join me in welcoming Tony. Thank you, um, and thanks to Carmel for setting a nice background sort of context for what I'm going to say. Um, so the Health and All Policies Initiative has been operating in South Australia since about 2007. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. The basic philosophy behind it is working um, with other sectors, not just the health sector, but other sectors across the South Australian government to undertake work that will progress those sectoral goals as well as um, progress health and wellbeing goals. And so we've been involved in some research um, which is theory driven, but what I've tried to do today with the presentation is to distill some of the findings to think about some concrete strategies that might be useful in progressing some innovative entrepreneurial work um, based on learnings from health and all policies. So I'll give a very brief introduction to the research project, not much time spent at all. Um, then just go through some of the achievements that Health and All Policies has produced. Then focus on four key facilitators that have emerged from our research before summarising these strategies. So the research team that I'm part of is quite large and the important thing to note is that it's an academic research team but it's also a policy actor research team. So this has been useful in helping us to keep the findings um, rigorous, academically rigorous but also policy relevant. So we're funded by the Australian National um, Health and Medical Research Council and very generously over five years, which is quite unusual for an evaluation project of this type. Um, in essence, what we're trying to do is establish whether the Health and All Policies Initiative in South Australia has contributed to health and wellbeing outcomes for the population. But a more relevant sub-objective for this presentation is to determine the effectiveness of health and all policies in motivating action across sectors. 
So we've collected a lot of data over five years, um, primarily through interviews, 145 interviews actually within the South Australian public sector context. Um, we've also undertaken workshops to develop uh, program logic models which articulate the theory of change underpinning health and all policies. We've undertaken two online surveys to track changes in attitudes towards health and all policies and also followed instances of health and all policies work as well as observed changes in the political and bureaucratic context that may impact on intersectoral work like that um, formed around health and all policies. So since 2007, um, Health and All Policies has generated 15 projects and these projects have involved the Health Department, multiple different divisions within the Health Department, but also 16 non-Health Departments or agencies across the South Australian Government. Um, local Council has also been involved in some. And what's been produced is three iterations of a model of collaborative work, so a model of how do you engage intersectorally, um, regardless of what your topic is. Um, there's also been sort of broad scale collaborative work with the World Health Organization, producing a model um, or a set of principles, I should say, around health and all policies that has informed international work in this space. Um, there's been strong links formed and maintained with the Department of Primary and Cabinet as the central agency of government, and these have been underpinned by two different memorandums of understanding. There's also been advisory roles for health and all policy staff, um, high level advisory committees, um, talking about different priorities of the government and how they can be approached in a way that promotes health, and multiple resources, as you can imagine, emerging from the projects. So in terms of they're the outputs, but what's actually happened? Um, we've got strong evidence uh, from the evaluation that there's been learning um, across the government um, in terms of the, the government sectors that have collaborated with health and all policies about how sectoral work can be done in a way that promotes health. Um, and this has been individual learning as well as collective learning across teams um, and sectors. There's also been that demonstration of cross-sectoral engagement as Carmel talked about. So taking it from the rhetorical focus, rhetoric, around it's good to collaborate, um, it's good to work together, to actually how do you do it? Um, and through that, as you can imagine, there's been broad networks that have been formed and relationships that have been sustained. So our job, our current job, is to take all of these learnings um, and these sort of outputs and think about, well, how do they translate potentially um, into predictable health and wellbeing outcomes? But from that, now I want to focus on some of the strategies that we've distilled from our research, which might inform some entrepreneurial work um, that involve intersectoral collaborations. So a very dominant theme that emerged from the interviews with um, people across the public sector from various levels of seniority is that one of the things that encouraged them to participate in health and all policies projects was the governance structure. It was an enticing governance structure. And one of the reasons for this is that it um, included links to high level decision making um, people as well as teams. So we can see here a quote from a workshop. Um, one of the things in favour in participating in the Health and All Policies project was um, the fact that it was reporting out to a body that I thought would have some influence for change. So people saw it as a vehicle that would do something and that was because of how its governance was situated. Um, this is interesting from a theoretical perspective because a lot of the research around intersectoral collaboration talks about coercive mandates, um, central agency or legislation or policy drivers forcing people to work together. Our experience in South Australia has been that the collaborations have developed more organically um, and perhaps have been more trusted um, and more effective as a result. However, um, even though the governance structure is enticing um, in terms of how health and all policies has been consistently aligned with decision makers or what is the centre of focus of government at the time, whether that be SASP, South Australian Strategic Plan, whether that be strategic priorities or a particular influential piece of law, for example, um, continually aligning with that centre of influence has been frustrated by what I would say is at times a fragmented strategic planning system in South Australia where we have multiple levels of drivers operating at one time. Despite the frustration of that and the difficulty in continually aligning with the centre, that work in making sure that the, um, the projects are relevant has been really um, something that has enticed people to continue to participate 
and you can see that from the next quote. Um, this person is a high level person in the government talking about a tactic. So my bias is to jump on the next shiny thing and to try and integrate the work into the centre and not be stuck where the last centre was, that centre of influence. But the risk of that is that you could go down with an idea as quickly as it came up. So it's about finding the best centre that you can, whether that's the next shiny thing or something else. But the key is to stay with that centre. Another way that health and all policies have found that common centre of, of influence or commonality um, is not just aligning with DPC or particular strategic priorities, but rather talking to people in other sectors, the sectors they want to collaborate, what drives work in those sectors, and really trying to get an understanding of that before proceeding with any work. Um, this has been particularly helpful in a context, even over the course of the last five years that we've been doing the evaluation, where there's been so many restructures and cuts. Um, but because health and all policies projects have been aligned with something that the, the departments are valuing, that are seeing relevant as their core business, um, health and all policies projects have in general been protected from that restructuring or those cuts. Um, and Carmel mentioned before the different ideologies, the different views that operate across sectors. And we found that understanding these um, as a basis for collaboration is imperative and potentially is a lever for innovation and doing things differently. And you can see that in this quote, um, the person who says, often people are really shocked to hear that another agency will have another view because one way of thinking about an issue seems so self-evident to them. That's why the intersectoral work, when it works, works so brilliantly because people are coming to the room not expecting anyone to say anything different and then suddenly hearing another viewpoint. That's what can leverage a real change in thinking and in how things are done. Um, health and all policies work um, has also been strategically positioned and there's different aspects of the findings that have emerged around this. Um, particularly people when they reflect on what made the project work, talk about um, positioning the cross-sectoral engagement or the particular policy topic in an area where it's considered valuable and not as an add-on. Um, and this can be involved in t this can involve um, positioning the work in terms of um, strategically based on sympathetic managers. So there's managers who obviously, particularly in the middle level, who can block things or sabotage things. Um, but we found that there's been most success for these health and all policies projects where people have actually found, you know, friendly sisters, if you like, that you can align the work with. There's also been um, a tendency for health and all policy staff to try and plan their work strategically around timing. And this often involves an empathetic approach. So listening to your collaborators, listening to where they're at, um, not pushing work if the context within the department is not favourable, listening and waiting. And this can involve perseverance, as you can see here. Um, so this is from a health and all policy staff member. Uh, a collaborator was really keen to do some work with us. He and I had a very preliminary meeting and somebody with somebody from his area. That person wasn't interested. So we organised a roundtable discussion with his department. Then nothing came of that either. Then his department went through quite a number of directors and even executive changes. And then they got downsized, but we kept the conversations going. And this was often through coffee, informal. Um, eventually we got agreement to start a project. Waiting for the right time meant that we got people in that area who were receptive to the ideas that emerged and there may have been even potential to continue the work. Shepherding. Um, now this is not in an AFL context, not a competitive context of protecting the bull, but rather um, looking after your teams, I suppose. So we've applied this um, concept of shepherding to some of the data that's emerged because what people are talking about is the importance of nurturing collaborations once they're established. So it's not just about setting up a group of um, intersectoral collaborators and expecting everything to proceed in a logical or good fashion. Rather, it's about somebody having the role within a collaboration of continuing to take care of that collaboration to monitor broader contextual impacts that may have the effect of compromising what's being done. From a facilitation perspective, it's really about bringing together the critical players and developing and maintaining those relationships, both through the agencies individually and government as a combined whole. 
My role has actually been about developing and maintaining relationships as well as good understanding of the content of the work and of the different things that impact on it. It's actually about having some defined role, which is someone who takes a helicopter view of all of the areas and impacts combined. And finally, the, the final sort of role or, or strategy is around champions. Um, so champions have emerged as quite important within our data. But it's interesting because over the course of the health and all policies experience from 2007 till now, um, the championing role has changed. So initially it was health, uh, health staff championing the concept of health and all policies. Since um, the projects have emerged and the collaborations have occurred over a range of different government departments, we now find that people in the other sectors are actually standing up and doing the championing role. And some people have commented that this is actually more effective because you're having people speak on behalf of health but don't necessarily have invested interest in health. So they might be from a mining department or they might be from education or they might be from transport. Talking about the positivity associated with working in a way that that progresses sectoral goals while also looking after the health of the population. Um, it's also emerged that, um, as probably would be expected, that it's important to have champions at all levels of seniority within government. Um, and that's what's emerged from these two quotes. So this person's thinking about health and all policies in the future and whether it might continue. The bigger question I think about high up in the future is, is there still support for health and all policies work? And in regard to that, it's not just champions at my level, the managerial level, who are required to actually value these things and see these things through. But it's also that championing of the process and the particular issues. It's looking at it from much a higher level. And then in relation to one specific project, the CE at the time, I don't know that he was a champion of it, but he didn't sabotage it, which is actually just probably just as important. Then I think there were other people in health and outside health at the time who were enthusiastic and worked really hard to make it work, but they put in the hard yards. There was an energy around it too, an intersectoral energy. Having a friend for HIAP in central government, someone supportive who we could talk to was really important. So then to sum up, um, so what are some of the key learnings that we've um, key learnings about factors that we've found that supported health and all policies collaborations that might be able to be applied in some um, of the innovative activities that you might be thinking of. So I think it's about finding a supportive and relevant governance structure, something that entices people to collaborate with you. It's about the strategic positioning of the work, trying to find that, that, that centre of activity, that centre of importance, but also finding receptive people um, and, and practising empathy in terms of when you push and when you hold back. Um, it's about shepherding and perseverance, so not expecting everything to happen at once or expecting that once a collaboration is established that it will continue. And it's also about um, deliberately fostering champions um, through multiple contexts across sectors and at various levels of seniority. And there's been some deliberate practices that health and all policies staff um, have applied to try and get champions on board, such as um, offering shared ownership of the work, not, um, not maintaining a health sector dominance. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. I'll also ask Belinda and Carmel to come and join us for the panel. Um, there was just something you, you were sort of saying about the being sort of receptive to the timing and being able to kind of listen for when the time is right that I think is really important in this type of work where you're trying to um, pull people together sort of in a way that they're not used to working, which I thought was, was really lovely. And the other idea about um, the diversity of ideas, that when, you know, often when we talk diversity, we're thinking gender diversity, cultural diversity, but even, even that diversity between, say, health and environment and where those perceptions come from is, is, really, is really useful. Um, so we, we have about 25 minutes for our panel. Um, to ask questions. When I looked at the, um, you know, what we're trying to sort of think about this is, is looking into the theory um, and how that links to practice and really getting down to some of those sort of deeper questions about understanding entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship and then understanding how we translate that into the workplace. Um, so I'm going to kick off a question which gives you a little bit of time to think. I'm kicking off a very selfish question because I'm a futurist by um, profession and so I'm always thinking about future and vision. And from all three of you, I, I, I sort of heard this 
thing that stood out for me, which is that role of vision being really important in um, guiding teams or leading um, people forward. So I just wondered if you could make a comment, each of you, to kick us off on have you got any advice, either from the theory side or the practice side, about where you've seen good vision or what you think helps contribute to a vision that is engaging, that draws people forward, or even if you can think of something that's gone terribly badly and why, if I could I open One up. of the things that we found in working um, across government is the government having a, a very clear vision uh, around where it wants to go and setting a, you know, a very forward agenda. And one of the things that we found in talking to people from multiple agencies, uh, and both inside and outside of government, the third sector as well, is that the South Australian Strategic Plan, I think, was a very good um, uh, a visionary document for people in, in the public sector. It laid out really strong um, uh, 100 targets, which many people thought was too many, but still, it was very clear. And so it was very easy to collaborate around those those high level, long term targets. They were set for 10 years, and then it, with the review, some of them got extended another few years. And I think that framework where everybody was involved, where the objectives and the targets were long term, they were being measured. So there was the accountability, um, and also uh, there was accountability within each department, but there was also accountability across government. Mm -hmm. So th that was a good example for me, I think. Yeah, great, thank you. Sure. Um, I've mentioned, mentioned before about opportunity coming, sometimes, sometimes opportunity knocks, and I think a lot of the organisations I've looked at, it wasn't purely an in-house opportunity, it was discussions with customers, um, with suppliers, whoever it was, and, but I think what matched that was having a very clear vision of the type of organisation they wanted to be or the direction that they wanted to head in. So often, you know, you'll get a range of opportunities presented to you, but if you see everything as an opportunity, you're probably not looking hard enough, that you need to be a little bit selective about that and if it's matched to your vision as to where you want to go, I think that makes it so much easier. And I think the kind of organisation that sees everything as an opportunity has just spread themselves so thinly that their vision has is lost a little bit. But it's someone who keeps that clear that has a better chance then of going forward. Um. I did most of the interviews for this um, project, so I've probably spoken to 80 or more public servants across the sectors. Um, and at times I felt um, quite inspired, I would say. Um, so there was a lot of discussion within the interviews about how hard public sector work was and how much um, the multiple layers of strategic priorities, how often they change, how often there's restructures, how often there's budget cuts, um, would just stifle creativity and belief. Um, but then you would get people talking in the interviews about really what made them tick and, and saying, well, why did you, as an individual rather than as your sector, collaborate with health and all policies? And they would start to talk about their vision for a better um, community, their vision to contribute to societies in which they want their children to grow up in or in which you know, it's a fairer society, even when fairness wasn't really something that was politically saleable. Um, people were still talking about fairness and that was their personal values. So I think the public sector definitely has people who may be feeling a little stifled or contained um, by the organisational constraints in which they work, but there's still those visions there. And when you can actually talk to people about what matters to them, those things come out. So I would, I would imagine through informal conversations or talking to people about what makes them tick, then you can actually start to spark that creativity and vision that could then provide a basis for entre entrepreneurial vision, I would say. Yeah. And that, I think that links really nicely to what Irma was saying to kick us off around uh, you know, ideas being the purpose of life and <laughs> connecting back to that, to that individual value. Have we got some questions from the audience? We've got two roving mics, so if you just um, indicate to me if you've got a question, then I'll send a mic your way. I'll start with you, sir, on table 12. Thank you. Um, oh, if you could just also start by letting us know who okay. you are and where you're from, and sure. if, you, if you've got it directed to the panel particularly, or anyone on the panel also state that. Thank you. My name is Lee Tuckwell. I'm from the Office for Digital Government. And um, uh, Belinda, I noticed on one of your slides you had a quote from Henry Ford about, um, you know, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for faster horses. Um, that it kind of that that sentiment some in some respects goes a bit against what we're 
going for now in terms of going out to your customers or going out to the stakeholders or people and asking them what they want, what their problems are, and then trying to address those. How do you and the, the rest of the panel see that, that challenge and about you know, getting past you know, the, the problem of people don't know what they don't know, you know, and innovation is about new ideas and if we ask people, you know, what they, what they need, maybe they'll just be re rehashing old ideas, you know, how do you get past that sort of a challenge? Yeah, I think that's a really valid point in that, you know, if, if you were trying to service every customer and every request, you could spend a lot of time and energy and resources, but really serving a very small market or, you know, doing something that isn't that marketable or commercial or doesn't have a, a long-term benefit for the intended segment that you're looking at. So I think that comes back to being very selective or strategic about, you know, listening to all of them, but being selective in which ones you address. And it goes back to that example, I think, of the state own enterprise which was in agriculture as an industry but had done the business management software now every person every potential customer wanted to tell them what they wanted differently on that product or what they would like done quite you know uniquely but they looked at the trade-off between well how is it going to better everyone or you know is it really just going to better one very small group of people and the time versus cost involved in that so I think it comes back to being selective in your opportunities and or selective in, in your vision and where that takes you. Because otherwise, yeah, there's a whole range, really there is a whole range of opportunities out there, but you need to be very careful about acting on the ones which you see as leveraging the most benefit and potentially, depending on your market, for the greatest number of people. Yeah. Um, perhaps it's also being strategic about how you question. So I'm thinking if I went to a public sector interview and had very closed questions where I already had ideas about what the barriers and enablers were to this kind of work, we may not have learnt so much. So it's about really talking to people about collaboration, say, and, and what does that actually mean to them rather than going in with a preconceived idea about what collaboration is and what might hold it back or and move it forward. And I think that's what the health and all policies experience has showed in terms of understanding from sectoral perspectives or from people's own perspective what's important and then working from that point rather than your own um, preconceived idea of that. Um, and I think it goes back to the first question that Kristen asked is about vision. So I think being clear about what maybe the long-term goal might be and perhaps working with um, community and citizens um, as, as important stakeholders in helping to determine how you get there. So it's more about perhaps engaging them in the process and that the, um, and that the outcome though might, you know, and they might help shape the outcome, but you're sort of clear at the beginning of the discussion where you're wanting to end up mm -hmm. so that you don't end up over here. Yeah, and that, that engaging the process is, is yeah. great because that reflects back on our diversity of bringing different yeah. thinking in as well. It's a great question, thank you. I thought I saw a hand up over there or somebody's just scratching their nose and now just hiding <laughs> from my microphone. <laughs> another, another question for our panel? Yes, up on table seven, please. As I said, any I mean, we're looking at theory and practice here and trying to get to the nub of you know, what, what we might know from any of those perspectives. So feel free to broaden your questions out on, on that basis. Professor Fordellan from uh, Strategic Economics, State Development. Um, Carmel and Tony, um, you focused on some of the cultural aspects, which, um, and particularly the silo aspects of how agencies within governments operate. Um, to what extent has uh, health and all policies targeted particular people as opposed to just dealing, and that's the tactics, as opposed to just dealing um, with the vision. And uh, what's your learning? I mean, how have you seen kind of change uh, kind of wash through the system? How effective has a, a health and all policies been at changing some of the culture of that, that silo mentality? Um, well, I think there, so we have definitely focused on people. So, you, you know, you, the relationship starts with identifying um, people in an, a particular area that um, are, are wanting to work with us. So one of the things that we do is we, um, in the early days, we would identify from South Australian Strategic Plan policy issues that we would get sort of told, go and work on that. So. 
Um, and rather than going and knocking on people's doors saying that we were from the health department, because people in um, the uh, land management council or people in the education department don't really care about the health department, we should go away and fix our own business, we would say that we would come under the auspice of the Department of Premier Cabinet. So Cabinet Office have led us there. So we would use the leverage of having that central authority and that central mandate to open the doors. And then we would just persist until we found people that were prepared to talk to us. We also didn't go in, one of the other things that I think was important was we didn't go in with um, a preconceived idea necessarily around, so we might have had an issue say, for example, um, Aboriginal life expectancy was one of the things we were told we have to address. So we went to go and talk to a number of people around Aboriginal life expectancy and through a number of discussions we ended up looking at um, road safety because Aboriginal mortality rates were high as a result of road safety issues. And rather than taking a road safety focus because of discussions with policy people in, um, in a number of areas, we ended up with driver's licensing because driver's licences are a, a means to, to help you be able to uh, drive a car. And they also had a lot of other spin-offs in terms of Aboriginal identity. So not going in and saying from a health department, well, we really want to fix road safety and we want to make cars safer and we want people to drive safer. Well, listening to what the opportunities were, where the complex issue was, where there was, a, where there was capacity and interest in trying to make change and, and flowing that way. And at each of those steps, working with people who were interested in wanting to work with us. And, and as Tony said, I guess, nurturing those relationships. So to your last part of the question about whether we've made cultural change, I think there's some small elements and some small pockets. But I suppose the fact that there was such strong support for the 90-day project, which is really about strengthening the things that we have the privilege to learn through applying health and our policies to all policy issues across government. And the fact that um, SMC seemed, they said they're very enthused about it. So I guess it, I think it's a, it's a wait and see. But I think, yes, there seems to be more appetite for it now than there was, you know, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. Would you say that? Yeah, I would say that. Um, I think one of the, the definite outcomes that we can prove through the, the data that we've collected is that there has been some cultural change, um, whether that be in individual teams who are close to the person where, who has worked with health and all policies or whether it's broader than that. That probably depends on the particular example of the sector. Um, but I was thinking about the same um, example that Carmel used around Aboriginal licensing. and. I think that one of the things that made that collaboration work to the point that it did was that you had people around the table who were sympathetic to that cause. So that project involved listening to some quite harrowing information around Aboriginal life expectancy, Aboriginal disadvantage. Had you not had buy-in from the particular people there, they might have stepped away from the table. There might have been less, um, there might have been more resistance based on, well, this isn't necessarily our sectoral business, it's not something we have to do, so we're not going to participate. But through targeting particular people who are interested in the issue and who had a passion, I think that's what brought the sectors around the table. Uh, yeah, I just like how that links both back to the inadvertent brilliance. You know, by following the line of inquiry and listening, you end up with something that seems like a um, a tangent but actually then becomes very valuable and then reflects on what Belinda said earlier about building on your strengths and um, you know doing things strategically you know how far outside the box and to me that one kind of sits in an interesting position where in some ways it's quite outside what you might have expected but in other ways it builds completely on the strengths that you've got so a great a great example but isn't it interesting because that's exactly what mining companies as well are starting to do that Fortescue metals and that they were finding that in remote areas you know it was, it was declining populations and really they much prefer to have local staff than fly in fly out you can build a community you can um, also support the local economy and so they were trying to get um, Aboriginal uh, people local to the area involved and one of the things they found is okay well they're not completing school so how do we keep them in school then you know they're not don't have a driver's license so they can't get to work so then they started giving the introducing programs to make sure that they had those things which really for most of us are just so inherent to us growing up but they weren't necessarily in these remote and regional areas and um, and it was interesting because the public sector was trying to get the same outcomes but wasn't successful in what they were doing and when they sell Fortescue doing such a good job of delivering it because it didn't end at driver's licences. It then started with apprenticeships and obviously Fortescue had a limit of how many they 
were able to employ, but they entered into contracts with other large mining um, organisations on the expectations, and I think it was written express expectations, that we expect you will also have a percentage of Indigenous um, trainees over the next five years. And so it was building a culture, but a, a regional culture, around inclusive communities. And it was very clever things because, you know, there's actually a criticism in corporate social responsibility literature of, well, how convenient for companies to do something that works for them and you think, well, actually, yeah, it worked for them, but it's worked for the community, it's worked for the government. The government actually started funding Fortescue's programs because they found that Fortescue was getting better outcomes than the government was by themselves. So I think it's when you start collaborating, and, and like I said before, there's nothing wrong with replication, but it's making sure you replicate the good ideas and getting the good outcomes wherever that comes, whichever sector that comes from. There's a question on table eight. Um, just following on from oh, it's Anne Bozio, and I'm in Families um, SA and Office for Child Protection. Um, I'm interested in terms of the issue of integrating and embedding, um, and um, and I guess the thing is, you know, you've talked about 15 projects with um, 16 organisations, you know, with 16 organisations and things. But if you really wanted to change culture or ways of doing things and systems, then um, what do you think are the learnings? or the, the challenges for integrating and embedding um, a, a new way of doing things. Yeah, I think that's, really, that's a really good point and that speaks to sort of the broader findings of our evaluation. So one of the huge challenges has been embedding more systematically thinking about health and I think that's one of the problems in Rob's um, point about targeting people. If you've only got individuals within a department rather than broad scale buy-in, then that's very hard to change a culture. Um, but in response to your question, I think it's a matter of scale. That's how we're approaching it in relation to health and all policies. So health and all policies really, at its peak, only had six staff. It was a very small team um, in an environment, as Carmel mentioned, that's focused on illness. It's not focused on health. So it was often attacked, I can probably say that, Carmel can't, um, it was often attacked from inside rather than outside um, and so those six staff had to work very, very hard just to maintain the project focus that they had on the go. The extent to which um, the projects have resulted in results that have been embedded in broader systems, it's variable. And I'll draw on the example that we used before. One of the success stories is the Aboriginal Road Safety Project, where we've actually now got in the um, APY lands driver training programs that have resulted in more than a doubling um, of people in those lands with licences. Um, then you look at other projects which really had to be shaped back um, as a result of the lack of cultural change, I would say. So the restructuring came in, the, the project could still continue, however, it was never gonna reach the big broad vision that it had in the beginning. So I would say that it's, it's a matter of scope. Health and all policies wasn't funded to the extent that it needed to be to reach broad cultural change. And I think in the areas in which it did, it relied on those champions and those change agents really driving it and, and favourable contexts. We'll have, to, we'll have to leave it there because um, other people are joining us, but I encourage you to us keep up that conversation over lunch in a minute. Um, for those who've just come in from the other room, we've been talking about theory and practices around entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship um, and collaboration. And if you can join me in please thanking Carmel, Tony and Belinda.